I'll just go ahead and say, I'm, uh, if, if I have to cough or anything during the presentation, I'm sorry, I'm getting over a cold. If my voice, crack, it's, uh, if my voice cracks, it's because I just hit puberty. So we'll just go ahead and get that out there. <coughs> All right, so what are we here to talk about? We're here to talk about the next big things. What, uh, you know, when we talked about social networks four years ago, who would have known that Facebook was going to overtake places like Google as the most visited website on the internet? I mean, we couldn't have predicted it. We couldn't have predicted the importance of geolocation. Some of those things have had, you know, I mean, we can say, you know, these things are coming, but, you, you know, um, I'm trying to remember who it was, said, if you can imagine a future, the future, the actual future is so far beyond what you can imagine. Just like, you know, cavemen could have never imagined the Industrial Revolution. Uh, anything scientifically advanced enough seems like magic. So <clears throat> that being said, we're going to talk about things that are here now that were science fiction two years ago. So, so and hopefully maybe up into five years. All right, if you have your smartphones, if you have a uh, QR code scanner, these are QR codes, uh, the new serial codes. If you have a smartphone, you can actually take a picture of this and download the presentation onto your phone. Follow along, snazzy. <coughs> this is in the HTML format. This will take you to a web page. Um, users at home, we're streaming this live, by the way. Uh, users at home can click this too, just to let you know. Uh, if you'd like to download it into a PowerPoint format, uh, you can click this one. So <coughs> give everybody a second. Oh, nobody's going to get their phones out. That's fine. <laughs> By the way, I have lots of lol cats in the presentation, and I'm kind of flying without notes, so it might get funny. <clears throat> okay, so where were we? This is a map made by XKCD. Uh, it's actually an online web comic uh, who is run by a mathematician. So he took data from Alexia, which is an internet traffic monitor, three years ago. This is 2007, <coughs> and uh, said, all right, well, where were we in 2007? We see MySpace, huge, and look how small Facebook is. This tiny little dot, excuse me, in this internet sea. <coughs> so, where are we now? Get a little mental picture of this. This is where we're at now. Facebook, enormous. Farmville uh, is now one of the largest games. Farmville, long ago, overtook every major uh, World of Warcraft, every major multiplayer online game as the largest game in the world. So this is, uh, yeah, uh, spring and summer of 2010, same group, XKCD. Uh, it's also interesting uh, to note, if we see this is, this is sort of the social network uh, section of the internet. Uh, he also broke it down by the internet total, and we still see email is huge, uh, SMS being large, and that's a small, small area of spoken language. <coughs> if you want to see these larger in your office, this presentation will be available, and all these are clickable links. It'll take you to really high resolution versions of pretty much every picture in here, excluding the lol cats. <coughs> okay, talking about millennials, uh, the Beloit College. Uh, releases every year the Beloit College mindset and it's something they release to their staff to say these are things you might not think about these are things that our students are experiencing or have not experienced that you may have no conception of so I just pulled out some that I found kind of interesting uh, of course we know students think email slow uh, never never twisted the coiled handset wire aimlessly around their wrist while chatting on the phone because they've always had cordless phones. As long as the students of the class of 2014, the students that enrolled this fall, <coughs> this is who we're talking about, have never lacked a CD-ROM drive. Uh, uh, the first computer they touched was an Apple II or Mac II. That was actually the first computer I owned. Uh, <coughs> so I just threw some of these on there, and of course they've always been able to watch the Sci-Fi channel. Uh, Sci-Fi is not, uh, there are no dummies. They know exactly uh, who their audience is, and we'll talk about them here in a second. Now, whoa, where's my mouse? Here's, <coughs> uh, here's a video 
made by a person, uh, Jess Three, uh, for a conference. I don't have my notes. Um, anyway, it, it's, it's a conference and it's talking about sort of some numerical values from the end of 2009. It was uh, made in February 2010. So let's pull this up and hope that it will come up on the right screen. Yay. That number is now on around 30 million.
04 is the beginning of Facebook. Think about that. <coughs> Facebook's been around six years. Google Buzz, which has actually already been shut down by Google, so not everything works out. <coughs> Aha, all right. All right, so what else, is, uh, what else is happening on the internet right now? Well, QR codes are becoming commonplace. Uh, you will actually see these in magazines and on television now. Uh, talking about the Sci-Fi Channel earlier, uh, the season finales of Warehouse 13 and one of their other top shows uh, actually used Shazam, which is the top music application for mobile phones now. Shazam is an application uh, where you can record uh, a 30 second clip of any song. It goes out to Shazam out into the cloud and comes back and says, this is what that song is. It's magic. My teenage daughter uses it constantly. I mean, she's got hundreds of songs. She's, I've, got to, I've got to get this. So <coughs> uh, Sci-Fi, knowing their population, has started saying, oh, if you Shazam, they'll put a little Shazam icon down on the bottom of uh, some of their shows. So if you start recording when that Shazam icon comes up, you'll get access to exclusive content on your cellular phones because they know who they're marketing to. Uh, also, QR codes, uh, you'll actually see these for they can do them for a split second because they know anybody that's going to click a QR code is probably going to have a DVR at home. They're probably going to be able to say, hey, what was that? Pause, rewind, you know, pause. Uh, Fox has actually been really uh, <coughs> prevalent in the use of those QR codes, which uh, if you don't know what those are, you, you've got your barcode, which is two-dimensional. A QR code is just two, essentially two barcodes overlaid. Uh, so it becomes a three-dimensional barcode. So, <coughs> okay. What's happening on the internet? Uh, well, this is this is a, an icon graph uh, of all of the top websites on the internet by traffic uh, through Alexia. Again, I, I would read you the percentages, but they're really tiny on this. Uh, Google, of course, really big. Facebook, we all know, is huge. Yahoo has actually stayed very relevant, both as a search engine for people and as an email client. Uh, MSN, MSN has done the same. Uh, YouTube, of course, being the largest video uh, host, is also a subsidiary of Google, Wikipedia, Twitter, LiveJournal. You see some of the big ones out there. Um, Craigslist. So. It's interesting. A lot of people think Google has branched out and done all these wild things, but what they don't realize, what this, this just came out the other day, Google still does search. 95% of their, I think it's 11.72 yeah, 11 billion dollar profit, profit <laughs> is search. So uh, still largely a one trick pony that Google is. <coughs> okay, what else is going on? We talked before about texting. The prevalence of text messaging with teenagers, how uh, cell phones were second only to clothing. This is the prior talk we had. Cell phones were second only to clothing in the uh, designation of social status among teenagers. Uh, this has held absolutely true. <coughs> uh, text usage by age, of course, still booming in the 13 to 17 year old. Uh, Texting and mobile internet usage is up, I think, it's something like, uh, texting is up 8% over figures from last year. Uh, mobile internet usage is up 63% from last year. <coughs> uh, here are some little infographics. I'm actually going to click on these because uh, otherwise we'll never be able to read them. Uh, and these are just some little facts about texting. I won't go through all of them again. You guys can, uh, you guys can go through this. 72% of cell phone users send and receive text messages. We found actually uh, in our uh, last talk that about 75% of you all send text messages, so kudos for being ahead of the curve. Um, some interesting uh, stats, and we also, uh, that last meeting we found that about 50% of you use mobile internet. Uh, that's probably risen now. More of you probably have smartphones, uh, iPhones, Android phones, Blackberries that do mobile internet. 
Uh, so, but here is, of course, the big deal. 18 to 29, 95% text message. Uh, if you, I, I found pretty early on, uh, before I got a smartphone, that when I wasn't text messaging, people thought I was a Luddite. I'm like, no, really, I'm up on technology. I know about this stuff. And they're like, yeah, but you don't text message. You know, I don't want to call you. Um, so 4.1 billion texts every day. <coughs> Uh, this is an interesting statistic. As text, as text messaging rises, uh, phone call lengths have dropped on average. 33% they have dropped. And think, that is in two years. Uh, if you think that trend's not going to continue, you're crazy. It's going to continue. Uh, of course, we all know not to text and drive. Blah, blah, okay. Uh, three out of five teenagers say, uh, sexting is unsafe. Sexting, of course, is the sending of naughty text messages and or picture mail back and forth. Uh, if you think it's not happening, you should probably pull your head out of the, out of the sand because uh, that means two out of five think it's okay <laughs> just to reverse that number. Um, so sexting by age. Uh, what was the other thing on here? Let's go look at it. Um, uh, oh, interesting fact on why texting is limited to 160 characters. Uh, they did research and wrote random phrases, short, uh, short sentences and things, and found that 150 characters was the amount that a person would write on a postcard. And so they thought that was a, an approximate, uh, approximately good number for uh, SMS, for the simple message service. Uh, so, and if you want to feel screwed by your phone company, 60 to 70 billion every year they make off text messaging. Text messaging costs the phone companies nothing. Zero. It's sent on the, the thing that updates your status on your phone, like how many bars you have, that is the same like ping signal that carries the text message. Your phone is getting and receiving those all the time anyway. They just tag the text message on to that data and that's how you send and receive it. So it costs them nothing. So if anybody just wants to write an angry letter. <coughs> uh, a, few more, uh, a few more facts about tech, uh, text trends, particularly among teens. So we know that girls text a lot more than boys uh, to the tune of 100 plus texts a day. Actually, the statistic I read is that teen boys text about an average of 3,300 texts a month. Uh, teen girls text over 4,000 texts a month on average. Uh, and having a teenage girl, I can tell you that's absolutely correct. <laughs> uh, so some statistics. Uh, one interesting statistic is the growing population of 25 to 35 year olds who are text messaging. Uh, you know, their population wise, they're not making up the largest amount of cell phone usage but are making up a larger and larger amount of uh, text messaging. Uh, of course. Uh, and so here's the interesting fact on here, that uh, the first text message was sent in 1995 and was then, not terribly long after that, adopted by, uh, <coughs> by cell phone companies as a standard. Uh, and at that time, they sent an average of 0.4 messages a month in 1995. Uh, 2009, 5 trillion SMS messages were sent. Okay, it's texting. It's still big, it's still hot. It's gonna keep on being hot. All right, <coughs> let's talk about Facebook. Um, who knows what Facebook places are? Have you ever, who's ever used Facebook places? Okay, all right. Yep, one honest person. <laughs> I'm sorry? Yeah, uh, any, I'll, I'll, sh I'll pull this up here and we'll, we'll talk about it. Uh, okay. Uh, if you want to talk about, I, actually, Facebook Places is not as big a deal as uh, Foursquare. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, Foursquare is another geolocation social network service. Uh, sorry, I should have logged in here before. Uh, 
uh, it's a social network service that's geolocation based so you can be like, oh, I'm at Buddies or I'm at Tally Ho or I'm at k -Layer. <coughs> and you can tag where you're at. Um, the interesting thing is a lot of people have their houses tagged as this is my home. Uh, so there's a site called pleaserobme.com. Uh, <laughs> that what it does is it takes aggregate data from these, from these uh, geolocation social networks and posts when people aren't home. Um, <clears throat> actually, uh, you know, and, and, and that's just going to become uh, more and more prevalent. I really thought I was going to be able to show you guys this on here, but apparently not. Bummer. <clears throat> okay, well, I apologize. I can't show you Facebook Places live on here. <clears throat> Actually, I take that back. I can. I can do it on my snazzy phone. <laughs> uh, what you guys are seeing on screen here is actually live streamed out of my phone. So it's a little slow, but it's kind of cool. So. Uh, Basically, Facebook Places, though, is, is Facebook's foray into this sort of geolocated social network thing they're trying to get, uh, get everybody on to. So, so let's see. Okay. So the last time I checked in was Saturday when I was in Paducah for roller derby at the Italian, uh, Italian Village Pizza. Uh, my friend Virginia, who probably not watching this online, just checked on in at the Niles Gallery. Uh, so basically, it's only checking you in when you want to check in, when you want your friends to know where you're at. Now, a lot of people have their Facebook profiles locked down so that only their friends can get to them, which is cool. That's something I suggest. Um, so, you know, unless you just don't want your friends to know that you're, you know, out doing whatever or... Uh, out of the mall, you know, maybe like, man, I really, I know if I send this out that John's, you know, Johnny's going to come out here and he's going to want to hang out. And I don't want to hang out because I promised my wife we'd hang out. And anyway, so there, there are times obviously you don't want to check in, <clears throat> but for, uh, for a lot of it, like I posted, actually I posted that on Saturday when I was in Paducah and my other friends who use Facebook Places who are in the roller derby, we got there really early, so we had lunch. And so they found us because I posted on Facebook. They were like, oh, well, they're over here, and it's at this location. They were able to pull that up on their phones and, uh, and come hang out. And, of course, so you guys have seen the big Facebook Places icon. <coughs> uh, Facebook in general uh, is flipping enormous. We'll talk about it in a little bit. 30,000 servers, that statistics from earlier. Uh, it's probably in the neighborhood of 40,000 now, but when you talk about uh, cloud computing and how that's a big deal, uh, which we'll get into in a second. So why, uh, one of the big things I want to touch on is why bandwidth is going to be more important than processing power. Um, it used to be that you needed a fast computer to do stuff. Well, now even a mid-range computer can do pretty much everything we want it to do, and that's because of Moore's Law. Moore's Law states that, I think it's every 24 months, a uh, processor, the number of transistors in a processor doubles. <coughs> so basically think of it, every two years, processors get twice as strong. This has held true for, you know, the last 40 years. It's, it's probably not going to change anytime soon. So things are going to get more powerful. Uh, if we look at it in terms of what an iPhone costs today $600 out of contract, and that would be a 1x power. Okay, that's a lot of math. Stay with me. <laughs> uh, so by 2020, we will have devices 32 times as powerful as the iPhone because uh, Moore's Law has held true for cell phones exactly as it has for PCs and Macs and those kinds of things. The difference being uh, cell phone processors are almost exactly 10 years behind on the curve. So right now, cell phone processors are about, excuse me, here, which is true. The Pentium 3 to Pentium 4 processors were when we started getting into past the 1 gigahertz range in processing power, which is exactly where we are in cell phones today. We're in the 1.5 gigahertz 
as the fastest uh, cell phone processors made today. So we are following this trend exactly. The thing that makes it interesting <coughs> is we're using a lot more bandwidth through our cell phones than we used on our desktops uh, as far as we have our cell phones with us more frequently. So we are using that data more, and particularly kids are using that data more. Again, internet usage up worldwide 64%. That's from last year, okay? Uh, mobile data usage up 68%. So uh, with mobile applications taking up 50% of that, that, uh, that number. <coughs> so those kinds of things are what are driving these new applications. They don't need to be fast because they can use this thick broadband pipe to go and talk to the cloud. They can go out and talk to this big mass of computers. So they don't have to, my cell phone doesn't have to be the fastest thing in the world. All it has to do is be fast enough to send something out to a really fast computer and then it can get it back equally fast. The pipe is the important part, not the piece at the end. So, so what is this cloud? Uh, let me first give you an example <coughs> of what, uh, what a cloud is capable of. Um, do, you guys ever, uh, do you guys ever use voice to text tr you know, things? Uh, some of the people in Disability Resource Center I know have, but it's a really shoddy technology. It's never worked right. No one's ever, you know, natural voice and language have always eluded computers until now. Now, I can pull up, listen to Medley 2002. Okay, and what this is actually going to do, it goes out and it says, what is this Medley 2002 that you want to listen to? Oh, well, it's a, uh, it's a, P well, <laughs> network issues. <laughs> it's a piece of music that I have out on a server here at work that is now streaming down to my phone. All because I was able to say what I wanted to listen to. Okay. This, uh, this is Final Fantasy Distant Worlds from a video game because I'm not just kind of nerdy, I'm ultra nerdy. Um, <laughs> So here we, have, here we have a streaming track coming from a server here at UK to my phone because I talked, it went out to the cloud, translated what I said into, uh, into text that the phone could understand and gave it an action to say, he wants to listen to this particular song, find this song for him. And it went through every music collection I had, found that track and is playing it on my phone. Okay, so that is what cloud computing is about. This is the, the power of being able to pull things from these pieces of the internet. <coughs> cloud computing, uh, let's, what is cloud? <laughs> I don't think cloud here, but this is what a cloud computer would look like, except more like the size of an aircraft hangar and less the size of a room. So uh, when we talk about cloud computing, we're talking about computers in a, a numbers that are so unfathomable to us. Uh, this is an interesting little infographic. Uh, the turtles, the turtles reference is because uh, I'm also a philosophy student, so the nerddom just keeps on rising here. Uh, the number of servers owned by major corporations around the world. <coughs> now, Intel, this large red block here, is the top microprocessor manufacturer in the world. They're the ones that make the processors that go into all of these servers, primarily, them and AMD. But Intel has been one of the head, uh, as far as research, most of these other blocks that we see are large-scale large, large scale web hosts, hosts that host thousands and thousands and thousands of large, large uh, web pages. So some in Europe, some here in the United States. Uh, okay, so, uh, you know, it seems like a lot. Okay, 
then again, you have Facebook at 30,000. Intel has three times what Facebook has. Facebook, to give you an idea, um, six million people hit Facebook a minute. That's a hundred, that's, do my math right, that is a hundred thousand a second and they stay online with 30,000 servers. That is a hundred thousand a second or essentially uh, a server for every three people, okay, that are hitting it every second. That seems really big. Like, gosh, if you had a server for every three people, uh, think about also how much bandwidth and things they're using, just expending constantly. 100,000 users every second, and their website stays online. Dr. Todd gives his uh, address here at UK, and we have 150 people trying to get to a web stream and can't get on. So, you know, when you, when you think about the amount of uh, data that uh, gets used, it's just unbelievable. I mean, the, the stability is pretty wild. So Facebook has 30,000, Intel's up there with 100,000, some of these other big servers. Now let's talk about Google. One million plus. That's current estimates. Um, Google has so many machines that they bought power, they bought power companies in California just to keep going because they couldn't keep buying electricity, so they just bought the whole company. When you make 11 billion in profit every year, you can do that kind of thing. Uh, so when we talk about the amount of, of machines, it's hard to fathom how, like, how much hardware we're even talking about there. Uh, <clears throat> so that's why you know, the world rests on top of this turtle's back. It's a, it's a philosophy metaphor. And, uh, an astrophysicist was giving this explanation of the universe and, and how the world uh, spun around the sun and everything. And this, this lady in the back says, well, that's, that's preposterous. I know that the world is indeed flat, and it sits on the back of a giant tortoise. And the astronomer uh, said, said, you know, well, what does, the, what does the turtle stand on then? And she said, ha, you're smart, but it's just turtles all the way down. So... <laughs> The internet, it's a big thing, but it's just turtles all the way down for Google. It's just machine after machine. <clears throat> okay, so another part that Google owns is YouTube. Uh, if you want to talk about immense amounts of traffic, uh, what we're going to see, I believe video immersion is another big key point I want to touch on. Right now, uh, in the last two years, images overtook HTML as the largest source of traffic on the internet. Uh, images now take up 65% of all bandwidth. People looking at pictures on well, 30, 30 billion pictures on Facebook, uh, <coughs> things like that. Prior, it was the HTML itself for the web pages that they were viewing, and the pictures didn't amass to a whole, whole lot. Then we had this multimedia explosion about 10 years ago where pictures became more and more prevalent on the internet. Now pictures are the largest source of traffic on the internet. And I promise you, the next large source of traffic will be video. It's, it's gonna happen. I can now take my phone, stream high definition video live to the internet from my phone that then other people can get on their phones and watch off my phone. This is astounding. <laughs> like, this is science fiction. Think about what, where we were at five years ago. If somebody pulled out a phone and said, I'm going to broadcast this to all of my friends live, you would say, that's, that's impossible. That's preposterous. Now we do it every day. So let's talk about the behemoth that is YouTube video. Uh, YouTube, you know, all these stats basically break down into 77 gigabytes per second every second of every day all year long. Um, 25 petabytes a month, that is the equivalent of 1,250 Library of Congresses every month. Uh, or about a Library of Congress every hour and a half. So, <clears throat> 77 gigabytes per second constant, that is 
a, uh, to give you an idea of how large that is, a DVD that you would watch, big movie, Transformers 2, eight gigabytes. Okay, maybe everybody doesn't like Michael Bay, that's fine, whatever. <laughs> Titanic, uh, eight gigabytes on a DVD. That's, nine D that's more than nine DVDs a second. So imagine the entirety of a movie, nine movies simultaneously every second. That's what YouTube is putting out constantly. Uh, they pay something in the neighborhood of, I think it's 1.2 million every month simply for their bandwidth. Uh, again, you know, we can't sustain a, uh, not we at UK, but we, uh, we normal people cannot sustain a video of, of Dr. Todd with 400 concurrent users. They have, you know, 100,000 concurrent users, a million users a day watching, uh, watching, I think it, well, more than, I'm sorry, like 10 million users a day. It's, it's basically 10 million videos per, it's 10 videos per user is approximately what people watch on YouTube every day. So you're talking about an astounding amount of bandwidth. Uh, the data rate is unbelievable. <coughs> Video is going to be one of the things that drives this next iteration of the internet. And why is that? Because the internet is trying to become more like TV. We like TV because when we watch TV, you turn the TV on, what happens? Does TV ask you what do you want to watch? No. TV starts playing something. If you don't want to watch what the TV's playing, you say, oh, I want to watch Judge Judy. <laughs> you know. You click and you, you click up to go to Judge Judy, but, you, but there's always that chance that when you turn that TV on, gosh, it's, it's already on uh, X-Files. X-Files rerun. I want to watch X-Files, you know, or Fringe. I'm a big Fringe fan. Um, so what there's a big push to do from both Apple and Google is to bring Internet to the television and bring the functionality of television to the Internet. Uh, video is going to be one of the next battlegrounds for... Uh, the platform wars. Microsoft, uh, Microsoft has, has largely bowed out. It's no longer Apple versus Microsoft because Microsoft knows they're not going anywhere. Apple's not going anywhere. Now it's going to, the next battle is going to be over the mobile markets and sort of integration into the home. So we'll see things like, you know, we're already seeing Apple versus Google as far as iPhones versus Android phones. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about this, but basically YouTube Lean Back is something that they came up with and it works. Uh, it works like this. You click on, you go to Lean Back Fuck's in a while, and now. it starts playing. It doesn't ask you what you want to see. Now I can go down <coughs> I can go down and we can listen to whatever we want to listen to. By the way, I haven't monitored any of this, so sorry if anything comes. Uh, so it's, it's just going to come up, and what it'll play, it'll just start playing sequentially. Uh, if you have a YouTube account, uh, it's also meant to be controlled with one hand. Uh, I'm not having to manipulate the mouse. It's all done with arrow keys. Uh, using left and right, I can just start playing whatever I want to play. The TED Talks personal favorite of mine. Or if I want to hit up, I can do a search for uh, lady or <clears throat> so she's a friend of mine. So what it has done there is it turned my search into a channel. So this is a friend of mine who's a DJ up in Chicago. So here's, you know, every video that she has on YouTube that's tagged with her in it. And it's not necessarily videos in her channel that she has produced. These are just videos that mention her. And I can just have this run in the background. And it's because Google wants to make the video experience on the internet exactly like the video experience that you have with your television. It's going to send it to outer space. So. Uh, 
So this is YouTube Lean Back. I just wanted you guys to check it out. It's actually kind of cool if you do have a YouTube account, it will, it will create a channel based on your favorites and the things that you've liked, and it will essentially guess what you want to like next. Like, oh, well you like Harry Potter and you liked Well, I can't think of anything other than Harry Potter right at the moment, but... <laughs> okay, so I'm really nerdy. Uh, it's going to... Yeah, Lord of the Rings. So it's, gonna, it's going to then say, oh, well, you probably want to watch a trailer from another sci-fi movie. Uh, Piranha 3D. Okay, that was a poor choice, but... Uh, so this is YouTube Lean Back. I encourage you to check it out uh, because I think it is going to be one of, the, one of these things. That's, it's, it's sort of a medium that's happening right at the moment until we see a full immersion in either direction. Uh, I encourage you guys to, to check that out. Okay, so that was YouTube Lean Back. Uh, the next big thing, of course, are bringing the internet to your television, which Google is doing through various set-top boxes and Apple is doing with <laughs> Apple TV. Um, Apple actually released a prior version of Apple TV a couple of years ago. It didn't catch on very well, but see, now what everyone is using as their uh, magic bullet is Netflix. Uh, gosh, you can plug this little box up and I can watch my Netflix on my TV? You sure can. You can also do it with a Nintendo Wii, an Xbox 360, or a PlayStation 3. But uh, with these, <coughs> the ability to search for, just like we did on YouTube Lean Back, where I went up and I searched for Lady Foursquare to listen to my friend from Chicago. Similarly, this will go out and it will search Hulu, uh, YouTube, Netflix, and it'll say, gosh, is the Lady Foursquare anywhere? Well, she's not there, but let's say Leonardo DiCaprio. Woo! Uh, <laughs> and, and it will find movies you know, by him and everything, and then it can create a playlist similarly to YouTube Lean Back and these kind of devices. So we're going to see the, the battle for the living room and the battle for uh, the cell phone in your pocket is definitely going to be the next big OS war. Um, okay, so now let's talk about the new era of inputs. I know we're going to talk about a lot of stuff, and I know you guys don't have questions. And I promise I'm going to shut up and let you ask them in just a minute. So give me just a minute. So the new era of inputs. Have any of you guys, raise your hand if you've seen Minority Report. Tom Cruise doing cool stuff on a screen with his hands. That stuff was science fiction, right? Totally not anymore. Now, the images. And using a hand, we can actually <coughs> exercise six degrees of freedom, six degrees of so, freedom. What he's doing is he's using those gloves, which have sensors in them, just like in Minority Report, to zoom and manipulate objects on a screen in three dimensions. So, the interesting thing, this, is, this was from two years ago, okay? This talk, this is a TED talk, by the way from two years ago and he's using that glove with, sensor, with, with sensors on it. Just like in Minority Report, Tom Cruise used a glove with little LEDs on it. That was so that the computer could identify his hands and understand the gestures he was making. So, I don't need to hear him talk. I'm talking here. Uh, so, it was so that the computer could understand his hands and the gestures that he was making. Well, the cool thing is, that was two years ago. Minor Minority Report, I think, came out uh, three years ago. So this was a year after Minority Report. Here's somebody showing a proof of concept how this is actually feasible. Okay, well, that's awesome. <coughs> well, motion control is here. I mean, it's not science fiction anymore. This is a... Uh, it's just a funny little graphic. How many of you used a Nintendo Wii? How many of you guys have played with a Nintendo Wii? Most of you, okay? It's the most popular selling console uh, by Nintendo of all time. It just recently beat out the Nintendo Entertainment System, uh, which celebrated its 25th anniversary uh, on Monday, because I'm ultra nerdy. Uh, it's a point we're gonna keep coming back to it, just I'm bringing it home. <coughs> so everybody's used a Nintendo Wii, 
it's interesting. It's cool because you use it and you play tennis, and man, you just, you're really swinging. And that is so neat, that immersion into a virtual environment. Before we talked about having three-dimensional avatars as something that can represent us in an environment. Well, now we have methods to represent ourselves in a full three-dimensional way. So one of the ways that this is being done is with Microsoft's Kinetic. Uh, Kinetic is, uh, well, the Wii came out and everybody's like, wow, motion control is awesome. How can we make this better? Uh, then the Kinetic and the PlayStation Move came out, which are also motion controlled. The PlayStation Move uses a wand that is not unlike a Wii remote. Uh, it's used, but it's one-to-one, -one, so your movements are precise, uh, unlike the Wii. The Wii is a little, not quite one-to-one -one ratio. The Kinetic, however, is the most interesting of the three because the Kinetic requires no controller. Uh, so this is, uh, let me just show you a little brief demonstration of, uh, of them showing off the Kinetic this from there to there. These are unrelated machines. Okay, well, first we have to watch an advertisement because those YouTube guys, they're not dummies. <coughs> Uh, Paul is the designer of this. <coughs> Maybe it's easiest for him to come over here and tell me in person what's going on. Okay. So let's get some of these out of the oh. way. And now, with Connect for Xbox 360, we are oh. also making it simple. Now that we've watched the thing, hopefully it'll let me jump to the spot. Thanks, Mark. Yay. The first yeah. thing I'll do is show you how easy it is to sign in. All I have to do is wait. And Connect recognizes. Now he's waving, and the way it is recognizing him is facial recognition. It is recognizing his face in three dimensions to sign him in. And I land here on this easy to use, controller free menu of a lot of my favorite things to do on Xbox 360. This is the Connect Hub where I can find my friends, my games, and a lot of other great content like Netflix, Facebook, and Last FM. Everything's in one place. It's simple to use, and the best part is, no controller required. Now, using my hands is a very natural way to access my entertainment, but what could get any easier than just using my voice to select something? All I have to do is say, Xbox, and Connect is listening. So if you can see it, just say it. Zoom. Last year, we brought the entire catalog of Zune movies to Xbox 360, streaming many of them in full 1080p with 5.1 surround sound. And today, you can see how Zune is transformed by the magic of Kinect. All I had to do was say a simple command, and it brought me here to all the entertainment that I care about. My movies, my TV shows, my music, it's all there. And now I can just use my hands to select the movie that I want to watch. Now, I love the special effects in Alice in Wonderland, so let's take a look. Can't go wrong with Johnny Depp, right? Tim Burton. All right, now I want to show you my favorite scene. All I have to do is just bring my hands up and a little to the left. Uh, a little far, how about right there? Yeah. It's, it's simple. <coughs> it's natural. It's effortless. That's how easy it is to control Zoom movies with Kinect on Xbox 360. And what I can control with my hands, I can do just as easily with my voice. Let me show you what I mean. Xbox, pause. Now that's pretty slick, right? <laughs> and when I'm ready to go, all I have to do is say, Xbox, play. This is what we mean by controller-free entertainment. I don't have to fumble around in the dark for the remote control. I don't have to remember which one is pause and which one is fast forward. It just works for me. Xbox, stop. And the great thing is, Zune isn't just about the movies, but it's also about an amazing catalog of music as well. Xbox, play music. All right, all right, so now I can listen to Justin Bieber, or I can see what else is on this playlist. All right. And he's using simple swipe gestures with his hand. 
to switch tracks. All right, now that's more my style. That's more me. So that's doing music on Xbox Live. It's an amazing way to listen to all your favorite songs and music videos. In fact, over 7 million songs are now instantly available right in my living room, the place where I entertain my family and friends. Thanks for showing Zoom to the audience, Ryan. No problem. Okay, so what he just showed us was completely hands-free entertainment. Uh, <clears throat> let me just ask the obvious question. What else does Microsoft make? Anybody? Operating systems. Operating systems. What do they make? They make Windows. Microsoft is in a unique position with the Xbox. It allows them to have a test bed of something like 150 to I think maybe 180 million people that they can deploy something like this that's gesture recognition. They can deploy that to those 150 million kids, work out all the kinks. If you think that this isn't going to be in the next version of Windows, you're crazy. This will be the way you can control computers. I'm, I'm, I won't even give it five years. I'll say three. Three years, you'll see this kind of control mechanism for your PC. Uh, because it's no longer about uh, touch screen. You don't have to touch anything. Why do you have to touch when you can just gesture? I can just click just like Minority Report. Five years ago, it was science fiction. Today, it's reality. It's more advanced than what we saw in Minority Report because it requires no gloves, it requires no special uh, user interface. This is all natural. <clears throat> Again, natural language, uh, just like he did with, uh, with the, uh, the voice being able to stop and play. Similarly, back over to my phone. Uh, because again, my phone doesn't have an advanced uh, processor like a, like a gaming console does. However, <coughs> uh, because it has that thick pipeline up to Google, which has a million freaking servers out there to do whatever I need it to do, I can pull up my phone and say, text Angela King, I love you very much, honey, exclamation point. It's my wife, by the way. Okay, I had to input nothing there. I just told my phone what I wanted it to do. I want you to text my wife. Tell her I love her very much. Let's send that. Now she's probably gonna send me something embarrassing back and you guys can all read it. <laughs> um, let's just go ahead and get off this screen then, shall we? <laughs> just in case. <laughs> Oh, we'll know if it comes through because I haven't turned the f my volume on my phone down, so. Okay. So, again, natural language. I was able to talk to my phone, tell it exactly, uh, I, I, could, I can send an email in the same fashion. I, with my phone, I can say, send an email to Betsy Mahoney. Uh, I'm going to be late for work today. My cat threw up. <laughs> you know, and it will, it, will, it will compose that email knowing that, oh, I want to send an email to this person and because they've got so much experience with natural language, because Google has other services like Google Voice where they have phone calls, and one of the interesting things about Google Voice is it will automatically transcribe voicemails that you receive. That helps you because you don't have to listen to the voicemail to get the gist of the voicemail, but it helps Google because you say, was this helpful? Yes, then it says, I know I transcribed that correctly. So it then learns a little bit more natural language every time it transcribes a voicemail. So it's, it allows them to hone this natural language interface. There's actually big uh, Department of Defense research grants about this. It's a big deal. So natural language, natural gestures, these things are going to, uh, we'll get to 3D in a minute. Uh, these things are going to eliminate the keyboard and mouse. With absolutely within 10 years, probably within five. Buckle up, kids, because <laughs> it's going to get real. Uh, think, about, think about all the, all the data entry that you do that is just simply text. Now, there, of course, there will be needs for it uh, for people 
uh, people like Carrie Ball who have to program web pages and have a lot of special characters and things. Those kinds of things are going to take a long time to, uh, to perfect, but it's, it's going to happen. It's, it's happening, like right now. Put on your tinfoil hats because it's, it's real. Okay, so what else is cool? Uh, 3D. I put this up here because it's actually my favorite 3D movie. It's kind of old. Uh, Use the old red and blue glasses there. Uh, and I remember just being scared all to pieces about that because, oh my gosh, the Freddy Krueger's claws are coming right at me. Uh, 3D, of course, we've all seen. Uh, how many of you guys have seen a 3D movie in the last year? Avatar, right? <laughs> it's okay. And you watched it with a pair of these glasses, okay? These are not the old style, see they're actually green. Uh, these are not the old style red and blue that we're used to. How do these work? Well, the old red and blues use two different, uh, two different projectors to project the different images, whereas now these are polarized. So if you have like polarized sunglasses, you can actually tilt these and see like which way the polarization is in the glasses. Uh, so now they just project one image with two different polarizations so you can see it. Um, that's cool, but how many, of you, how many of you wear glasses and then had to put 3D glasses on over top of them? Oh, yeah. <laughs> it's annoying, right? It's like, the, it's like the worst and it's totally not fashionable. I mean, look, see, handsome, <laughs> less handsome. So, I mean, who needs that? I want to look handsome at the movies for my wife. Come on. Um, so what's happening now? Well, glassesless 3D. Again, this is not science fiction. Uh, it looks, I have seen it, it looks like a hologram coming out of a television. Unfortunately, I can't show you any pictures or video of it because it doesn't work that way. <laughs> uh, so this is real. Uh, it's real. It's happening right now. The Nintendo 3DS, which is launching, I believe, right after the holidays. Uh, their stock just went down because they announced they were having to go back uh, till after the holidays. Uh, has this technology built into it. This is a game system that kids are going to use. We'll have glassesless 3D, and it is amazing. It looks as if things are coming out of the screen at you. Um, this, is a little, this is a little on the science nerdy thing, but I can explain it a little better. Imagine if you're looking at a screen that is built with a lot of little, like, concaved tubes, okay? So these concave tubes, as you look at it, the concave nature, your left eye is only going to see part, this part over here. It's not going to see this part being blocked here. So your left eye will see this part, whereas your right eye would see this part or some of this part. So it eliminates the need for these kinds of things because you don't need glasses because it's already it's using the the nat your natural vision just the way you see in three dimensions it's putting uh, just like those faces that you see at a haunted house that are concaved and they appear to follow you it's the same thing except they're using uh, using LEDs instead of a concaved uh, a concaved surface so. Does that, does that help? Does that everybody kind of get that a little bit? Yeah, right on. And it's crazy. So <clears throat> three-dimensional technology is here. Uh, it's, it's science fiction, like crazy. <laughs> uh, it's unbelievable to look at. I wish I had something to show you, but well, oh, I, I, I was going to say, but I work here at UK, so I don't have a 3D TV yet. <laughs> so. Um, before we get to questions and the awesome cat, uh, let me just say, what does this mean for the future? What, is, what does this give us, uh, you know, a sense of what's coming down the pipe? Well, simply put, processors and phones are going to, going to get better. Uh, processors and phones will get better just as the bandwidth uh, improves. The bandwidth for phones has improved exponentially faster than the processors. Uh, it has gone far beyond Moore's law of processors because phones have just, you know, the first phone's data was 10 kilobits a second, very small. 
and now we're into the hundreds of kilobits a second. And now with uh, the newest iteration of phones, it's like two, three megabytes per second. That's equivocal to what a lot of people were getting at their home connections. And the next generation that just got approved, I think, is something like 200 megabytes a second uh, for WiMAX, which is a big wireless thing. So this, this pipe, uh, this pipe out to the cloud, to this big nebulous group of computers that will help to make your phone do things that are impossible by today's standards, uh, is going to improve. Uh, similarly, we will see, uh, now we see phones that have cameras that I can take your picture, and then we now see iPhones and Android phones that have cameras that are forward facing so that they can take my picture while I'm taking your picture, or I can video chat with someone. Um, I promise you, uh, this is not an if, this is a when. Uh, they are already making three-dimensional glasses-less displays for phones. They will be out next year. 3D phones. Like, it's, it's already been announced. It's already been, press releases have gone out. They're coming out. Uh, the next step to that is this immersion in 3D. Uh, all it requires <coughs> is two cameras. And then suddenly your phone can see in 3D just like you can see in 3D. Just like the Kinect can see in 3D. So your phone will be able to see you and broadcast you in three dimensions to somebody else. So, you know, invest in acne medicine because, man, teenagers are really going to blow it up here pretty soon. Um, so, okay. So think in the future, it's, it's entirely possible that we will have three-dimensional phones that can broadcast in 3D, do facial recognition and gesture recognition uh, simply to control the phone. Touching the screen will no longer be necessary. You'll be able to motion in front of the phone. I mean, that's technology that's already being worked on right now. So I know I dumped a whole bunch of stuff on everybody, and probably there's a bazillion questions. So let's go ahead. Well, it's, I'm a, kind of a cheap guy, and I've got the cheap cell phone uh, plan. And you know, I pay 20 cents per text. Uh, yeah, once I come in and once I go out. And students have no problem now texting me. That wasn't a problem a year ago. I wouldn't say it's a problem. You know, it's not that I mind the text or, you know, but it's, <coughs> not, it's just the natural way to communicate with people. And so what would be the correct answer to that? Do I need to up my plan or do I need to communicate with students? Like, hey, look, they're all on unlimited plans. Plan, so. yeah. I, 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 would buy, I would probably bite the bullet and get an unlimited text plan because, uh, like I said, that trend is not it's not going, to, going away. As a matter of fact, I don't know if I mentioned this during the slide, because again, I didn't have my notes up. Uh, it's actually the most prevalent form of communication for, I think it's 13 to 20 year olds now. The, the most prevalent, more than talking. More than talking, more than face-to-face -face communications, they text. So, yeah, I mean, so we're talking about the students that are here now are texting more than they're talking. They, they would rather text you than see your face. Not like you particularly, Barry, but you know. <laughs> Me too. Don't feel bad. Uh, well, they've done all this fancy video and processing and all this stuff. When are they going to come out with a decent speaker on a phone? <laughs> you know, uh, that, that's an excellent. Well, a, lot of, a lot of phones, uh, the newest generation of phones actually have uh, microphones in the front and back. Uh, to do active noise canceling so they can detect when a sound comes in and from what direction and actually do active like then make the reverse sound wave to cancel that noise out. Uh, so I know that's being worked on. Other questions? I, like I said, I dumped a whole lot of, there's a whole lot of future. The fact that you're all not wearing tinfoil hats now amazes me. So, <laughs> yes. Hey Jack, can you talk a little bit about security for these servers? Um, uh, you're talking about you know, the numbers that Google has, the number that, that, that all these companies have. And if there's any way to you know, terrorize us because we're so tied into this now, right. um, that would be the way to do it. Well, the whole, the whole idea behind the cloud is that whole pieces of it can go away. Uh, Google actually 
Let me put it to you this way. A couple of years ago, the CEO of Google went back to his college to give, a, uh, to give the commencement speech. And he said, never let anyone tell you that something is impossible. When he founded Google, someone told him, well, gosh, the way this is going to have to work, you know, they, they wouldn't give him any money at first. He, he couldn't get any uh, funding because people said, well, this is impossible. To have this, you're going to have to have a copy of the internet, the whole internet. And that's, there's just no way. And at that point, and this was, like I said, two years ago, he told that class that he has, Google has currently cached over three copies of the internet the internet, <laughs> like let that soak in for a minute. All of the data on the, the collection of digital human knowledge, Google has three copies of it. Uh, they don't have all their computers in one place. Uh, they have large data warehouses um, that, are, that are very secure. A lot of these places are. Uh, most of them are underground. Uh, a lot of them are underground. Uh, one of the places Google's actually talking about uh, there was recently a, an idea that they had to table, which was putting them into the ocean uh, because then they would be able to cool them with ocean water and power them with uh, waves. Uh, but they had to put that off because they feared that they would put so many machines into the ocean that it would change the temperature of the global sea, like all the oceans. So. They decided not to do that. They decided not to, you know, kill every fish. So, um, other questions? We talked about crazy things. We talked about 3D. We talked about, uh, yes? And this may be on the scope of what we can talk about. It's okay. But I know I have teenage kids, and we keep telling them, you know, why don't you go out with your friends, you know, spend time with them. And all of like, both of them are saying, well, I am spending lots of time with my friends. And particularly, I, our son plays a lot of video games with Xbox Live. And he goes, why don't you go hang out with them? And he's like, well, I'm hanging out with them. We're talking all the time. We're interacting. We're playing games over the microphone and stuff. Yep. And I just wondered, I guess I think to myself, what all this means for face-to-face -face communication, um, in interpersonal relationships and stuff like that. Yeah, well, there, there's actually been a lot of studies done about that. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, <coughs> Uh, there's not been anything conclusive at this point, <coughs> but uh, <coughs> basically what a lot of the people that are for this think, uh, kids are not going to stop doing it, you know, short of there being an EMP that knocks out all of electronics, um, kids are not going to stop texting, they're not going to stop talking to their friends online. Um, you know, again, it used to be that Kids had pen pals. Now they text everybody. You know, I mean, when I when I grew up, I remember writing letters to like foreign exchange students, and I thought that was the coolest thing in the world that I could talk to somebody across the globe. And now, it's nothing. You know, oh, you want to send the prime minister of France an email? Just, just click on his email address and send it, man. Not a big deal. So I, I think you know these these technologies are not going to go away. Um, we just need to figure out how to, and that's the thing is I, I give all this I give all this knowledge to you, with no pretense of knowing what to do with it. <laughs> like I have no idea what we can do with it. That's why I need your help uh, in at the University of Kentucky and in student affairs and in IT. I need you guys to to get with me on this train so we can figure out how can we utilize these technologies to build, uh, you know better student experience and a more cohesive educational environment. Um, a lot of those things, a lot of people say that kids that play games together, um, like for instance, kids that, kids that use uh, data-enabled cell phones are 50% more uh, active in social networks, which is the new, social, the new socialization. So kids that have data-enabled phones, not saying you should run out and get a, get a data phone for your eight-year-old, but uh, these kids are more active socially in an online context. What does it mean for the future of personal communication? You know? Means they're never leaving our houses. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Other questions? Yes, Jake. What do you see as far as the future and 
applications with uh, college students with disabilities? Do you think special? I mean, well, well, like I said, uh, the the voice recognition now, I can take uh, I can take this video of this presentation. Uh, and I can upload that to YouTube. The, the, uh, the introduction video that I sent you guys out, uh, that was closed captioned. I did none of that. All I did was upload that to YouTube and I said, closed caption this. And YouTube you know, went through it, cut it up, figured out where I was saying things, what I was saying, and then it just dumped it out and said, oh, well, here's what you said. You know, make any corrections you need to make. And you know, of course, I mumbled a little bit or whatever, so I had to make a few corrections. But largely, it, it did all that on its own. So I think we're going to see a lot more closed captioning. Uh, I think that's just going to become a natural part of the, video, of the integration of, of video. Um, a natural language recognition, like I said, I can tell my phone what to do and it does it. Um, I, uh, I take sign language and it's really interesting to me uh, when the forward-facing cameras came out on cell phones. That was like the biggest revolution for them because then they can talk in their natural language, um, you know, in ASL, and they can talk to the talk to their friends. Whereas before they were texting. And one of the interesting things about the deaf community is, uh, people who are born deaf have a very different like syntax to their speech, uh, the way that uh, nouns and descriptors are used. Really, very different than the way we use them in spoken English and written English, and so here they were finally able to speak in in their native language, and that was like a, the biggest thing in the deaf community. So, I, I think we're going to see, like I said, I think we're going to see more of that, and you know, I think eventually we'll see, you know, 3D. Uh, one of the things actually that's interesting, the Microsoft Kinetic, when it was when the patents were filed, because I've read the patents, because I'm still super nerdy. Um, the patents for the kinetic actually, one of the initial things in the patents were that it would be able to understand sign language as a text input method for the kinetic. So uh, that didn't make it into the final version, but they said it's still on the table that they're going to develop that because it can see in three dimensions. And that's really been one of the barriers is being able to tell when someone gestures forward or back. Um, and now they can. So. I think that you know things like that are going to be big boosts for the disabled community. It, listening to all this is quite phenomenal, and I'm thinking in terms of higher education, cost in the future for that education based on technology. What does that mean for institutions in a tough economic time, as well as families who are going to have to hopefully have right. these things in their homes to better prepare? <coughs> what? Cost-wise, how do you see all this panning out? Well, um, broadband is almost ubiquitous now. Almost every, you know, a lot of our students come in uh, with internet, you know, already in their house. Uh, the sub one thousand dollar PC market, particularly the sub one thousand dollar laptop market, I can go out and I, I mean, I I did. I just bought my wife a new laptop for three hundred bucks, and it was it was the laptop that I would have bought. Um, that's the same amount of money that people are going to spend on an iPad, for instance. Uh, and those, so I think that there's a price point that they're trying to keep on these new, these new era of devices, these new touch sensitive devices, because they want, just like with your cell phone, they don't want you to have to pay, you know, you're not going to pay $600 for an iPhone. You'll pay $200 for an iPhone if it's on a contract. Uh, so they're trying to make it subsidized through and we'll, I, I think we will continue to see these these products subsidized if not through the cell phone companies and through some other things um, I, if you want my opinion on how students are going to get access to the internet in the future I think it's going to be cellular I think that uh, it will not be long before cellular takes on cable for the broadband provider for your household the concern I'm having is the, those students or socioeconomic families being unable even to get like a low level. Out that really are we pricing them out of the educational experience? Well, even even older internet, it, the key is you know initially there was a big push to get internet, get a, a com internet for every child, you know like 
that was one of the big pushes that a lot of educational systems had, to get every kid online. Um, we're getting to the point now where those first generation internet devices, just like uh, we saw with the, with the Moore's Law slide, um, five and, you know, we didn't have uh, internet enabled iPhones 10 years ago, but we did have them like f four years ago. So it's not going to be long. I mean, you can now buy a first generation iPhone, which can connect to the internet and do things. Uh, you can probably get one for you probably find it used for 50 bucks. So I, I think it's gonna be, you know, the push is gonna be to try to get those students to be able to get the cell phone companies and things like that to be able to help, you know, just uh, there, there's uh, money out there, there's money so that people can get themselves wired and how can that money be pushed over to the cellular networks so that students can be with this sort of new wave of mobile internet usage. I think, I mean, I think that's going to be the big thing. I, I think that we're going to see those mobile devices fall to a point that it will be very reasonable for even the lowest income of economic. That's the next question. <coughs> How are we going to get a reduction in the cost of the cell phone service? Well, I'll tell you right now that uh, if I were a betting man, I would say there's going to be a price war in about now um, because the iPhone uh, uh, is no longer exclusive. It will be on Verizon within the next year. Uh, the iPad is already going to Verizon, and that was that was one of the that was AT&T's golden goose. Let's be honest. That was what that was why AT&T was the most expensive cell phone provider because. They had a locked-in group uh, that grew every year because people liked iPhones. Um, but now that they're not an exclusive provider, um, you you bet you bet they will drop their rates. They will they will be competitive. They'll have to be because that was one of the big things uh, we saw a lot of com uh, competition in unlimited data plans when Android phones came out because AT and T could just gouge people all day long because you know you can do anything else with an iPhone but now we uh, Google brought out Android phones for every major carrier and so suddenly there was this big push for unlimited data for every carrier and you saw uh, data plans drop and go from oh you can only download so much to oh it's unlimited now you can download whatever you want um, so I, I, I think that within the next year when the iPhone loses its exclusivity then you're gonna see a pretty big price war across the board. Hasn't it already started with AT&T? I know they have the A-list now, you know, that lets you get 10 people for free, and then don't they have two different levels of internet service? Uh, most, most of them have, like, a limited internet service and an unlimited internet service. To be honest, I don't know all the plans. I can't, can't quote them off the top of my head, but, but you know, it would not surprise me if they've already started working on their pricing to, to get that down. Oh, abs <coughs> oh, absolutely. Um, I th think, and I don't quote me on this, I believe it was MIT actually uh, this last year put every single lecture for all, what? And Stanford. And Stanford. Put every single lecture from their professors online, available, publicly. You can, you can get an MIT education <coughs> if you can understand it from MIT by watching but just like just like just like what this will eventually become a podcast I think the benefit in that is setting up an interactive environment so that sure a student can watch this but if we can get a group of people to watch it at the same time then we can have a discussion and there's so much more you can glean from a discussion than me sitting up here yammering about 3D and sci-fi stuff so a lot more can be 
pull in, and I think that's going to be the way we will eventually have to go. Uh, I, think, I think the future of higher education will be in distance learning. What about residence halls? That is an excellent question. Uh, we will always have, uh, I think we will always have students who come here because there will always be, uh, there will always be hands-on things that need done at the university. And how will we have to have sort of a value-added residence hall where um, people come because of the technology? Uh, I, I think that, yeah, I think that'll be part of it. I think that it will also be a matter of students clumping together uh, just like uh, living in, in living learning communities where like-minded students will group together. I, you know, one of the things that you can put, these, these students can be technologically uh, as savvy as they want, but they still can't uh, use their phone while they eat a pizza, you know. So there will always be a time when they have to go to a dining hall to eat. And that's when these people will even for a minute unplug to go and have a social interaction and I, I just think it would you know it's going to be much more beneficial to have that interaction with the, that group of students uh, that you're already that you're already entwined with so yes do you think we're losing something in all this technology I mean when you go to the checkout line somebody's phone rings they answer it while they're being waited on if uh, someone's talking to you they whip out their cell phone when it rains um, if by do you mean are kids rude today? <laughs> no, uh, no, not just kids. No, and, and the thing is, it's I. My wife busts me all the time for it because I'll be at dinner and you know somebody will text me or whatever. I'll be like, well, maybe because now my mom texts, so you know, gloves are off now. Mom can text me, so. <laughs> No reason to, oh, I just didn't get your call and you didn't leave a voicemail. No, no, I texted you. I know you got it. Um, so I will I'll pull it out and be like, I'm just, it's my mom. She's like, mm, after dinner. So, but it's uh, one of those uh, infographics about texting I actually talked, uh, I'm not sure if it was on that or if it was in my notes to say, and I forgot, but uh, kids think it's like typically 18 to 25 year olds, uh, more than 50% think it is a okay to text while you're at dinner. Uh, of course, people any older than that think it's unbelievably rude, and the number that think it's okay drops to like 3%. Um, so I, I, I just think, you know, it's not going to go away. In other words, right? Yeah, yeah, well, we're. <laughs> We're, we're, we're losing something, but I mean, you know, I text my daughter all the time. She texts me. Well, I mean, it's just... I, I know, but like okay. when you're out, there, there's... So many some people like to just have a quiet dinner alone. It's not, not I'm not allowed to bring my phone on dates with my wife. It has to stay in my pocket. Unless, okay. unless, okay. unless she goes to the bathroom. It depends on how people end up raising their kids. Yeah. I'm not talking about just children. I think we've gotten off on... Are there any other questions? If so, if not, I'm not. Uh, I'll let you guys go because I've. That's my wife texting me back. <laughs> Let's give so. Jack a hand.